where do you think the big questions are right now with fair use? Are there are there uncertainties or is this settled? Has everyone agreed that this is the case and we're kind of moving on or like what, if, if not, what are the big unknowns? What are the big questions that are being debated? Yeah. Okay. So. Hey, everybody. Uh, today with us, Matthew Sag, a professor of law in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and data science at Emory University Law School. Professor Sag is an expert in copyright law and intellectual property. He's also a leading U.S. authority on the fair use doctrine and copyright law and its implications for researchers in the fields of machine learning and AI. Professor Sag is currently working on several theoretical contributions to copyright law in relation to AI and machine learning and a series of empirical papers using text mining and machine learning tools to study judicial behavior. His work has been published in leading journals such as Nature and the law reviews of the University of California, Berkeley, Georgetown, Northwestern, Notre Dame, Vanderbilt, Iowa, and William & Mary, among others. His research has been widely cited in academic works, court submissions, judicial op opinions, and the government reports. And last year, he presented in front of the Senate hearing. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for being with us today. It's really going to be a lot of fun, I think, for us and for our community to get a better understanding of copyright uh, but first, I'd love to get your uh, background. Can you tell us a little bit about what got you interested in the legal side of AI and machine learning? Yeah, yeah. So first of all, Kent, thanks for having me here. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure uh, to chat to you today. And I've, I've enjoyed our private conversations. Um, and I'm sure this one will be just as good. Um, so I started working on the copyright issues involved in generative AI before generative AI was a thing. Um, I didn't realize that's what I was working on. Uh, so since I think probably 2008 um, and a, an article that came out in 2009, I have done a lot of work on what I call non-expressive use of copyrighted materials. And initially, mostly what occupied my time was thinking about uh, historians and English professors and people doing corpus linguistics, basically anyone trying to analyze more text than any human can read, right? So uh, if you think about something like a word embedding or just a, a histogram of word frequency, if you want to know how many times the word whale appears in Moby Dick, right? You could read Moby Dick and count it, but if you want to know how many how many books in the Library of Congress talk about whales, then the only way to produce that data at scale is through text mining. And so the copyright issues in text mining turn out to be exactly the same issues in generative AI. Um, and so the question is really, is it okay to make a copy of a work that no human is ever gonna see or appreciate or enjoy in order to run a bunch of algorithms against that work and learn something useful from it, right? And you might be learning something useful about a particular work. Most of the time you're learning something useful about the forest and not any particular mm -hmm. tree in the forest. Um, so that's really what got me started and of course, uh, you know, over the past few years, um, you know, even before ChatGPT, it's sort of been obvious that this is a key issue in all sorts of machine learning. And then, you know, GPT happened and suddenly this is kind of, you know, the, you know, this is the biggest issue in copyright law today without doubt. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and it's really fascinating, I think, to hear how you describe the importance of expression and the importance of um, how it is used in the process of leveraging the data. But I think one, one thing that would be helpful for our audience, uh, what, what exactly is copyright? What, what is it that, um, you know, what, what, why does it matter? And what was it uh, put in place to protect? What exactly is it for? Yeah, so... Um... Copyright seems like one of these things that must have always existed, and that's definitely not true, right? 
copyright is a response to the printing press. But the printing press, uh, you know, it's sort of the movable type printing press invented by Gutenberg in like 1400 and something or other. Uh, it gets over to England in 1500 and something or other. Um, and then in 1710, so like not immediately, yeah. but eventually we see a sort of legislative response to some of the issues that are about printing. So the first Copyright Act, the Statute of Anne, is really about regulating the book publishing trade, right? It's an act that comes into being in order to preserve the interests of this sort of cozy group of London booksellers and publishers called the Stationers Guild, who previously had a royal monopoly. Um, and the way it worked was rather than giving the printers directly exclusive rights in books, the idea was that authors would have exclusive rights, but everyone knew that the authors would trade those exclusive rights to publishers. And that's essentially the copyright system we have today. Um, it's changed over time, like we've adjusted the system to bring in new subject matter, to deal with new social phenomenon. Like initially there was no public performance right in copyright, that's actually something in America that's only really been around in the last hundred years. Um, and so, you know, the way I see copyright, which I think is, you know, historically the only way you can actually see copyright is, you know, it's a human invention designed to make our society better, right? And, you know, I think it's, I think it's a good invention. I think that broadly it has made our society better. I think that without copyright, you know, how would authors earn a return on all the hours they spend, like creating and composing, uh, et cetera. Like they'd have to rely on patronage or government grants or something like that. And so really, you know, the purpose of copyright sort of big picture is to pretend that these things that are non-excludable, that you can actually copy at zero marginal cost, to pretend that there is some excludability in order to give people a right they can trade so they can make a living from working in creative industries. Yeah, and I think this is a, I mean, it's a very relevant topic right now because of generative AI. And so there are a lot of questions being asked. I think one area that would be helpful to understand is where are the limits of that excludability? What is it intended to protect and what is it not intended to protect? What, what is still kind of like permissible? Yeah, so copyright has always had like massive scope for reuse of ideas, <clears throat> reuse of facts, reuse of like even novel theories about the world, even artistic techniques. And on top of that, there's always been a fairly broad notion of fair use, right? The modern fair use doctrine that we have today grows out of a series of cases in England uh, pretty much since the Statute of Anne was enacted about a practice called abridgment. Um, and uh, so copyright was never meant to give people like soul and despotic dominion over their work. It was always, I think, been intended to sort of give people sufficient control and the way that kind of cashes out in terms of copyright doctrine is mostly in terms of the line between idea and expression, right? If you write a novel, then you own the expression of that novel. Um, and a literal copy of that novel is a copy and even a non-literal copy that's still like hues very closely to the original. So same characters, same settings, same kind of plot structure, um, particularly if the names are all the same, that could still be infringement. But you take it up a level in abstraction. It's like, you know, boy meets girl, they like each other, but their families hate <laughs> each other. That's clearly not right. copyrightable, right? right? <laughs> um, 
And so sometimes drawing a line between idea and expression is challenging. Um, but that sort of, you know, the idea that there is a line ultimately and some things are meant to be protected and other things are not, like that is kind of the basic building block of copyright. Okay, so you've framed it up in this notion of kind of uh, idea and expression, kind of two different pieces of the work, the idea itself and the expression. And you've also talked about kind of abstraction above that expression. So there's the thing in itself, the expression, but then there's almost this, this notion of meta information, it's things about that expression, how it was made, what it looks like, certain stylistic components. Those are kind of that meta information that are abstracted from the expression and not protected by copyright. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. So <clears throat> think about, uh, let's say you're a budding young chef and you want to write a compelling recipe book. Um, you might go and read some of the great recipe books and sort of think like, not just about the details of the recipe, by the way, that's a set of instructions that is not copyrightable because yeah. it's functional. Um, but you might think about, okay, how do I have the sort of the right mix of step-by-step -step instruction and sort of, you know, personal whimsical anecdote, how do I kind of get across my own sense of personality? And you might think like, oh yeah, Martha Stewart, like, you know, she's my woman. Like I want to be like her. If you read a lot of Martha Stewart and you kind of, you model how you write based on her, like that is something that, you know, perhaps isn't going to win you fans in every corner of the internet, but it's definitely not copyright infringement. So even if that's something that you, like a skill that you learn by kind of immersing yourself in that genre, like that's typically fair game. And if we're talking about cookbooks, then, you know, def definitely like the recipe on how to make a good chocolate cake is totally fair game because that's unprotectable. Um, but what you can't do is you can't just take her original expression and then just cut and paste that or use that to compete against her in the market. Like, you know, your product that you take to consumers has to be different in the expression, if not in the recipe or the overarching idea or the sort of technique or the style. Okay. That, that it's an interesting uh, segue, I think, because there's this, um, this element of looking at how copyright law comes into play when considering the training of models. And I think there's been a lot of, of debate and conversation about the applicability of fair use. But one of the main complaints that people have with respect to fair use is that these models, these generative AI models are in effect competing with the authors and the artists uh, for which their, their data was used to train the models. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you can share a little bit more about, you know, how, do, how does copyright law come into play when training and what are the big questions being asked and kind of debated right now? Yeah. So, um, you know, so as not to take like the, the next hour, let me, let me try and explain it fairly simply, but we are going to have to sort of break it down into a few different cool. steps. Um, okay. So every machine learning model that I am aware of starts with a copy of the training data. Like technically there should be ways to just do this on the fly. Like maybe you could train a music language model and just tune it to FM radio and never create like a fixed copy mm -hmm. of the works. But as far as I'm aware, that just doesn't really scale. So everyone starts out with, you know, a hard drive full of just copies of the training data. Um, and that's really important because the first thing you want to do is probably clean up the training data, remove the duplicates, remove things that you don't want your model trained on, um, and that kind of pre-processing. That is definitely an act of copying. Like that is an act of copying that usually copyright law has something to say about. So, you know, this is why, you know, all of these technological processes, like they do raise copyright questions. Um, now let's look at how those questions are answered, right? The next phase in training a model 
is if you look at something like GPT, you expose the model to very small fragments of text from the training data and you kind of blank one word or one token out and you say, hey, guess the missing token. And then you take that result and you use that result to update the weights in what's really just a large fancy statistical model. Um, and so when the model is trained, it's not like the model actually makes a copy of the training data. People talk about works being ingested into the model and you know, that is honestly just, it's, it's just kind of a dumb way to think about it, right? You know, these works are not ingested into the model in the same way like a donut is ingested <laughs> into my stomach uh. at morning tea time, right? No, like it's more like, oh, you look at the donut and you take this parameter over here and you tweak it to this and you tweak this parameter to here. And then you look at a different donut and you tweak a different parameter. Um, and so the process of training, like as the models are actually trained, uh, really isn't what we traditionally think of as copying, right? The copying all takes place beforehand. And if the model is trained, like what I would say, you know, is correctly or sort of in a way that seems appropriate from a copyright law perspective, um, you will be forcing a degree of generalization and abstraction such that when the model is finished training, it really doesn't look too much like any particular work that it was trained on, right? And so, and when so you think about I, I, just it, like to kind of recap and, and yeah describe what you you said maybe to make sure I, I have caught it completely. Um, when you are using the data, the data set that you're going to be using for the training of the model, that is where copyright is brought into question because you have made the copy for the purposes of training. You've pulled it into a database or some other a system mm -hmm. that is going to be used and fed into the training process, not because it's actually ingested into the model, but because you've copied it for the purposes of the training process itself. And that is where the scope of copyright really plays is how you brought those copies onto the machine and for what purpose. And I think the piece that you said towards the end there was uh, so long as the model is not overfit. And it's kind of the term that we use to describe that yeah. in machine learning, uh, but so long as it's not overfit and it's not really built to recreate any of that uh, data that was brought into the training, it is not really at any point violating copyright on the output side. It's not creating outputs that are copies of the input and therefore a copy of that expressive content. Is that the right way to explain that? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the right way to think about it. Now, of course, you know, that story becomes more complicated because we know, oh, actually, sometimes models do overfit, right? Sometimes uh, we still think pretty rarely, but, you know, we definitely have seen some compelling examples of things that you know, have been memorized by the model and through some clever prompting or even some not so clever prompting, people can extract from the model things that you're like, yeah, that looks a lot like this thing in the training data. Um, and so I think that analysis is really model specific, right? If you, if you have a model, you know, for one, like, you know, let's say you just didn't deduplicate your training data. Um, and you have like a lot of parameters in your training data compared to the size of information so a lot of parameters in your model compared to the size of your training data, then it wouldn't be surprising if the model you know, was just rampantly overfitting, right? Because you know, overfitting is a good way to win that game of predicting the next token. So the whole thing in design is you want to build a model that is forced to guess the next token by relying on something a little bit more abstract than just, oh, no, I've yeah, memorize this book. I know the word that's coming right. next. Um, the problem with duplication is, you know, if you start telling the model the same words over and over and over again, it starts to think, oh man, the specific, you know, this specific group of words is really important. 
I should, you know, it would just be more efficient to memorize it. Um, but yeah, so if we just, if we kind of abstract out a little bit and sort of think about, you know, imagine that you'd set things up really well to avoid overfitting and so avoid memorization, then yeah, you made a copy of your training data. It sits over here. You built a model. It's over here. It's a totally different thing. It's not a copy of the training data. It's definitely learned some very useful things from the training data, but it's not a copy. And when you prompt the model, you're not going to get copies out. Right. And, <clears throat> you know, if that, you know, if that is the setup we're describing, then, you know, the copyright question is really interesting. It's, it's, does that initial copying that no one is ever going to see that's kind of purely internal to the system. And it's just for this purpose of producing this more abstract thing. Is that fair use, right? At least that's the question under, under us law. Where do you think the big questions are right now with fair use? Are there, are there uncertainties or is this settled? Has everyone agreed that this is the case and we're kind of moving on or like what, if, if not, what are the big unknowns? What are the big questions that are being debated? Yeah. Okay. So I don't think, let me see. I think before generative AI came along, this was actually becoming pretty close to a settled question. I think that, you know, we, we had a number of different cases on different sort of analogous forms of non-expressive use, software reverse engineering, uh, you know, scanning term papers for plagiarism detection, scanning 20 million library books in order to do digital humanities research, uh, which includes machine learning, um, scanning those same library books to make uh, a search engine index. Um, so those are all litigated cases where the courts have found fair use. Now, None of those cases uses the, like the terminology, non-expressive use. Uh, but I think that label kind of captures what those cases are about. Um, and I think when generative a AI came along, uh, it sort of disrupted what had essentially become a consensus on that issue um, uh, because you know, just the stakes seem different, right? If you look at the Hathi Trust case, which is about copying library books to do digital humanities research, I mean, honestly, the authors of books could care less if someone uses a computer to read 100,000 books to say, let's construct a model of how gender is represented across time in, you know, 100,000 novels, right? No author is going to say, oh, that's really, you know, that's affected my interests. You know, it's displacing my market or it's just intrinsically unfair. Um, <clears throat> but now you've got, you know, very similar mathematical processes, you know, being used not to generate kind of abstract information, but to generate abstract information that then becomes digital artifacts that look a lot like the training data. So, you know, and particularly in the image world and the music world, it's like, you know, art goes in, art comes out. Um, and that, you know, you know, reactions to that, you know, some people's reaction to that is, well, those non-expressive use cases, they, you know, either they were incorrectly decided or each one of them is like a special unicorn and there's no general overarching principle. Um, and we have no Supreme Court authority on this. So I think, you know, people are free to make that argument. Um, I, you know, like, yeah, you know, I disagree. Like, I think, I think those cases, like they do fit together as a coherent whole. Um, but I think the second level of attack is to say, well, hang on, this generative AI stuff, this is not a non-expressive use because the thing that's coming out the other end, it's expression. Um, and I don't think that is exactly correct either because, you know, 
when, you know, when I coined the term non-expressive use, I really was talking about a use that doesn't convey the original expression from the original work, you know, because of course, even statistics, they become expressive when you write an article about them to explain what they mean. Um, so I don't think that's right, but that is something people say. Um, and then I think the third argument is, well, you know, this sort of non-expressive use argument, that's about the first fair use factor, which is whether, you know, the purpose and character of the use, there's more to fair use than that. You have to look particularly at the fourth factor, which looks at the market effect of the use. And it's when we get to the fourth factor that people say, <clears throat> hang on, you know, you're not just producing information about these works, you're using these works to create a substitute for these works. Um, and that I think is, you know, that's quite a plausible argument, right? That is, you know, you know, just because we've never really had that situation before, I think that, you know, like if a court came out tomorrow and accepted that argument from the plaintiffs, um, you know, I couldn't say, oh, well, that was a crazy thing to do that completely goes against all precedent. It's like, no, there's no precedent. Like some court is going to have to make new law on that mm -hmm. question. Um, but then the question is, well, what kind of law should they make, right? What, you know, what should we think of as having a market mm -hmm. effect? Um, and I think that's, that's kind of tricky. I think, you know, in, you know, before generative AI, I thought it seemed fairly yeah. clear, like, you know, a non-expressive use, it wasn't reconveying the original expression. So it didn't seem like there could be much of a market effect. But now there are sort of ways in which you could imagine sort of indirect expressive substitution. So I think, I think in terms of the fourth fair use factor, uh, there is some ambiguity as not just to how these cases will be resolved, but how they should be resolved. Um, but I think, you know, what is clear to me is like, you know, copyright owners simply saying, no, no, we, you know, because we see you getting value from the training data, we think that we should be able to control that value. I don't think that that's actually a strong argument. Um, although certainly, you know, if I own the New York Times, I probably would feel that way too. I, th I think it makes um, complete sense that people are at least trying to argue for uh, yeah. some amount of compensation in this, yeah. um, just because there's so much changing and it's, it's better to argue for it because you're never going to get another chance to. Um, what, one thing that I'm curious to pick your brain on, um, you know, with that, with that fourth factor of fair use, I think one question that comes to mind for me is the nature of the competitive entrant into the market. And I think when you think about an individual expression, I, you know, you used Romeo and Juliet earlier as, as an example, let's, let's assume it was still under uh, copyright protection. If I were to release something that was a, a, an expressive work that copied mass, uh, mass majority, mass majority of that expressive work, I would obviously be infringing. But I think the nature of this technology is almost categorical. It's not that any one model that is being released is individually competing with an expressive work. It is that the broad category of Gen AI, regardless of training data, is changing the capability set such that the market is, is changing, right? The market is being changed by the technology, not by any individual model. And so I'm curious you know, what is your perspective on that argument against the fourth factor of being relevant here? Yeah. So I, you know, my, my personal view is that like copyright has never been a right not to be subject to mm -hmm. competition. Um, and I think that, I think as long as, models are set up so that they avoid memorization um, or, you know, or at the very least make memorization you know, inaccessible. Um, I think that they are primarily going to be, you know, legitimate competitors in, in the market. 
Um, now, th there are a few like specific caveats on that um, that I want to sort of circle back on. But in general, like imagine, imagine a model that's trained on just a ton of popular music and then, you know, even like fine tuned on the whole catalog of Taylor mm -hmm. Swift, right? The music that comes out, like it might sound sort of vaguely Swiftian, <laughs> but anything that sounds like even vaguely close to an original Taylor Swift song, like we have existing copyright tools to deal with that. And, you know, the, you know, the musical infringement cases are such that you know, a court would probably just find those are infringing on like a traditional analysis. Like if, if one of the new songs like really strongly reminds you of one of these old Taylor Swift songs, then it's probably just going to fall over the line of, yeah, that's too similar. That's infringing. Um, particularly with the way we set that line in music, which is tends to be, you know, pretty pro plaintiff in that respect. Um, and then if it falls short of that line, then it's going to join all of the other works on Spotify for which the median play count is zero, right? Most works on Spotify never get played. So the sort of theoretical competition that Taylor Swift would suffer, right? Assuming, you know, that it wasn't branded or marketed as, oh, we derived this from right. Taylor Swift is probably going to be really quite trivial. Um, you know, I think, you know, I played around with uh, some of the music generation programs and I think, you know, one, they're amazing fun. Um, but there are like some of the things you, you hear and you're like, man, even with my knowledge of music, that sounds like an awful lot like, you know, and for me, it's usually, I can't quite put my finger on it, but with, I think music is really hard. Like it's really hard to avoid accidental infringement. Um, and so those things might be a special case. And I, you know, so to, like, I wouldn't want to predict the outcome of those sure. lawsuits, but if you, if you go back to text where all of this started, right, the, you know, other than like some weird instances of memorization in the New York times lawsuit, um, you know, in general, like the text that we're seeing from chat GPT and things of that ilk is like, it's nothing like what was in the training data, except at this very generic level. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, I just don't see those as having any kind of cognizable market effect. Um, you know, and I think the, the, there are a couple of issues, I think, just to sort of make this complete to circle back on that could change that fourth factor analysis. One is sort of a question of, well, how you got your training data. Because I think there is, there is a difference between just downloading things on the open internet that was sort of, you know, put up there for general readership and consumption. And, you know, um, certainly like, you know, violating people's paywalls is obviously like a non-starter. Yep. But I think there, there is also a decent argument that, you know, you shouldn't be able to bypass the market for access by going to websites that are just chock full of pirated material, right? That that seems like, you know, something you should avoid because, you know, the way copyright works is, yeah, you don't get to charge for people reading your book, but you do at least get to charge for the initial access to the book. And so I think, you know, that is, you know, like that's a slightly complicated argument, but it's, it's one that's being pressed in some of these cases. And I can see how it might tip the balance in some of those cases. I can see how like ignoring robot.txt sort of exclusion headers might tip the balance, you know, toward the plaintiff in some of these cases. Um, 
And so you know, that is the tricky thing with the fourth factor analysis is I think all these cases are different, but my, you know, my general take, and you know, I may well, you know, you know, I may prove to be right or I may prove to be wrong, but my general take is that, um, you know, when you have models that either don't memorize or, you know, effectively control the output of memorization, um, and they were trained in ways that don't seem to sort of trample over the kind of norms that we've set up on the internet, uh, that, you know, that should be fair use, right? And so a lot of the, you know, in, in the litigation, you know, like a lot of what we don't know is well, what is the degree of memorization, right? Exactly how were these models trained? Um, but if you look at, you know, if you look at what's the alternative, like in text, I'm not sure there is much of an alternative to just training on the open internet because of the scale that's required. Um, but in music, maybe there is, uh, and certainly in images, people have done quite a lot with a lot less. And, you know, and Adobe has, of course, they built an image model that's purely trained on content that they have the rights to. Now, I want to be clear, like the people who created that content, they never affirmatively envisaged generative AI and yep. agreed to it, right? It's just they licensed their rights to Adobe or they sold their copyright to Adobe for, you know, very small amounts of money with a certain expectation of the uses that Adobe would make. And Adobe is now like, oh, we're the copyright owner or we have broad licenses and we have enough to train this material. Like, I'm not sure that for the people who really don't like generative AI, I'm not sure that there's a great moral difference between the Adobe models and things like stable diffusion. Um, but there's certainly, you know, you can point to some copyright differences. Sure. I mean, I think this is, <clears throat> this is a point that I, I personally get really uh, strongly opinionated on um, because I think when we look at the outcomes of this technology, uh, putting, putting these models behind paywalls where creatives don't have access to them unless they pay one of these companies that has effectively inherited uh, through no foresight of their own, a large body of work that is now super useful in the age of Gen AI. They just bought copyright um, or, or licenses ahead of when it was needed. Uh, it, it's seemingly more beneficial to the individual creator to have access to the raw technology to be able to do things like fine tune and train and compete in this new market where we've already decided, uh, you know, it, it is increasingly competitive for the individual creator uh, if they don't have access to these tools. Um, so, you know, we won't go on that tangent, but I do think it kind of brings up this other piece around the outputs. And you already talked a little bit around how, you know, if a an output of one of these models is extremely similar to existing work, we already have copyright law uh, and, and processes to pursue a complaint of, of infringement. But in the case of creating something arguably novel, never before seen and not sufficiently derivative in any meaningful sense, um, where are we today on copyright with those types of outputs? And what is the protectability of the outputs that come out of these systems? Yeah, yeah. So this is another fascinating question. And I'll, I'll, I'll try and just sort of break it down quickly. Um, I think it's, to, to me, it's totally clear that if you have a product that comes out at the end of a computer process and all that the human did was like, you know, press a red button and say, you know, make me an image um, or, you know, sort of set some algorithmic process in motion that no matter how cool the resulting output is, it's not copyrightable, right? Copyright, just as a matter of long-standing doctrine, really requires, you know, is about human expression, is about translating the ideas, intentions, feelings, thoughts, and emotions that people have into some expressive form. And, you know, you have to be able to trace that through at some level. So, you know, if you, 
if you create a magical, you know, art producing computer, like good for you, but you don't own the copyright on the things it created. Um, but, you know, most people don't work that way, right? Most people are, you know, using generative AI in increasingly sophisticated ways to actually give effect to, you know, thoughts, conceptions, ideas, and intentions that they either started the project with or developed in some kind of interactive way. Uh, at the moment, the US Copyright Office is taking a fairly restrictive view. The Copyright Office will give you a copyright in your selection and arrangement of AI outputs. So uh, to take one well-known case, uh, the Copyright Office said that uh, uh, Cash Canova, who'd written a comic book, that she could have copyright in the story and the text and the selection of the images, but not in any individual image, because each individual image was just something that she had prompted from mid-journey. Um, and, you know, that, like, that might be right on the facts of that particular case, but it, I don't think it will always be right. I think that if you prompt with a sufficient level of complexity or you're engaged in sort of like a, an iterative interactive process, at some point, the things that result from the prompt become your own intellectual expression. Um, and I think, you know, the challenge for the Copyright Office is how do you have a rule that sort of makes sense in terms of copyright theory and is something that people could administer when it comes to registration? Um, and so I think, you know, it's, it's understandable that the office is struggling with this to some extent. Um, but at the moment, I think they're too miserly. I think that there really is a, you know, what they're not recognizing is that at a sufficient level of interaction, uh, you should probably just say, yeah, this person used the computer as a tool, but it is their work. Like their fingerprints are all over it and they don't need to disclaim every little piece or segment that was made by AI. Like maybe they should still have to acknowledge we used AI as a tool, but I think, you know, with enough human involvement, um, it just sort of, I don't really see the point of like Swiss cheesing people's copyrights in the way that the office seems intent on doing at the moment. Yeah, I think um, one, one thing that has developed pretty significantly over the past two years is the level of controllability in using these tools. And I think, mm. um, you know, we, we've seen this in image generation. Obviously, you and I have had a lot of conversations about controllability and how you can manipulate things with images. But even with music and video in the past, I think, month or two, um, we've seen the music generators. Um, I can't remember if it was Suno or Udio. I believe one of them allows you to upload kind of the initial 10 to 15 seconds of audio where you're playing like a riff yeah. or something like that and singing. And it then extends that effectively trying to mimic the pattern and giving yeah. you more of that content, um, which when combined with the ability to control lyrics seems extremely difficult to argue as being purely algorithmically generated, right? That, that, that human expression is kind of like the core root of what um, the system is, is kind of extending based off of. And in, in the video space um, with, uh, I believe, Luma's Dream Machine, which came out a few weeks ago and has been extremely popular, um, they now have key framing where you provide an initial image and a final image, and it kind of interpolates and gives you the middle of that. So it's basically how do I get mm. from point A to point B? And it's hard to argue that that would be possible without either of those inputs. And so I I'm curious, as as controllability increases, as the ability for human expression to be um, exposed to the AI models, if you will, um, how do you think that's going to change the Copyright Office's argument and, and ability to argue that these are not copyrightable works? 
I think that the Copyright Office is definitely going to mellow. <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, <clears throat> and like, you know, and it's, it's easy to be critical of the Copyright Office because, you know, this is something that basically hit them from nowhere and you, like, it kind of makes sense that their approach to this would be iterative. And so maybe like, you know, initially, you know, like they might have set the bar too high. Um, but I think you know, they are receiving a lot of vigorous feedback on this point. And I, I think they will mellow slightly. Um, but I also think it's important to understand like what really matters. So let's say, you know, let's say that you are creating a video and you make that video by essentially, you know, you dictate the start point and the end point, and then you have an algorithm fill in the middle. And let's say, you know, you work through like, you know, 127 different versions of that to sort of find the right one. And, you know, and ultimately what you get is like this, you know, 30 second video that you're happy with. Um, you know, even under like today's restrictive approach, like the finished video is going to be a derivative work of the start point of the end point you provided. So you still get protection against reproduction, right? And that may be all you need from a commercial point of view. Um, the, the, so I think in, in a lot of cases, like, you know, maybe the distance between where, where we are now and where we should be, like, it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, but I think, you know, in, in other examples, you know, it, it does. I think as controllability increases, I think the Copyright Office is going to be confronted with more and more cases of, yeah, okay, this is generative AI, but being used in a controlled fashion, and they're going to look at a painting like, you know, Jackson Pollock and be like, well, we gave copyright to that guy, <laughs> right? Who threw paint at a canvas, not in a completely random way, but certainly only with a very vague idea of the effect he was trying to create. And, you know, the rest is, you know, fluid dynamics and entropy. Um, uh, you know, I think, I think they're going to start to see that, yeah, this is a tool. But on the other hand, <clears throat> you know, if I go to mid journey and I say, you know, cat riding a surfboard in Atlanta, and that's the extent of my contribution, then yeah, no, I probably shouldn't get copyright for that. Right. Um, and so, you know, the, you know, the, the real question is like, how do we, how do we deal with those intermediate processes or how do we deal with, you know, something you and I have talked about is like where you, where you fine tune the model on, you know, highly original artwork and then use it to produce a whole bunch of other things. Um, you know, I think the copyright law analysis is, you know, even on a restrictive view, those new works are going to be derivative works of the fine tuning base in all likelihood. Um, but, you know, if that sort of generation process is not just, you know, press a button and go, but it's interactive, um, you know, it gets to the point where I almost sort of can't see the point of saying, oh, no, no, you don't get copyright in that frame. Right. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, I think, it's complicated. I don't think we're at the final endpoint yet. Yeah, I think there's a lot left to to still figure out. Um, I was speaking with the chief AI scientist at Databricks, and I asked him his estimate on timeline uh, for when we will have clarity on fair use with relation to generative AI. Uh, and I won't bias you with his answer. I'll share it after after I ask you the same question. What is your um, thoughts on timeline of when we have better visibility and clarity on these answers? Oh, I don't know. Three to five, three to five years. Five years. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, like, it depends on what level of clarity you're looking for. You know, like, if if the only thing you will say is clear is like a 9-0 opinion of the Supreme Court that is just, you know, no ifs, buts, or caveats, then you, then maybe never. Um, but, but if what you're looking for is a reasonable level of consensus that allows people to sort of structure their behavior in the marketplace, then I think three to five years. Um, and uh, yeah, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah we will. Awesome. Uh, well, Matt, thank you again for the time. It's been illuminating for me and for everyone who's listening. Uh, we will share some links to some of your recently published thoughts uh, and include those in the details below the video. Uh, is there anything else you want to share uh, before we leave today? Awesome. No, well, no, no this has been yeah, fun. Likewise, thank thank you. you for the time and uh, we'll see everyone else later and we'll talk to you soon, Matt. Bye. All right, Ken. I'll talk to you later. All right. Bye.